Hello and welcome to another Algebra 2 lesson by eMath Instruction. My name is Kirk Weiler and today we'll be doing Unit 12, Lesson 4 on Conditional Probability. Now this is likely the first time that you will have encountered what is known as conditional probability, so I want to jump right into it and start to discuss what conditional probability is and how we tackle it using our notions that we've developed already in probability. Let's do it. All right, changing probabilities. When the probability of one event occurring changes depending on other events occurring, then we say that there is a conditional probability, right? So, you know, we might talk about the probability it's going to rain given that it's cloudy outside. That's going to be higher than the probability it's going to rain if we don't know that it's cloudy outside, right? The language and symbolism of conditional probability can be a bit confusing, but the idea is straightforward and can be well illustrated with two-way frequency charts. So let's jump in and take a look at exercise number one. Let's revisit a two-way frequency chart we saw in the last lesson. In this study, 52 graduating seniors were surveyed as to their post-graduation plans, and then the results were sorted by gender. All right. So we've got male, we've got female, going to college, not going to college, right? So let's take a look. If a person was picked at random, find the probability that the person was letter A. Female, letter B, going to college. Great. Why don't you go ahead and figure out those two probabilities? This should be pretty quick. All right, well, there's a total of 52 people that were surveyed, right? The probability that somebody picked at random was female. We just kind of go down that column. We see that there's 22, and therefore that is 22 divided by 52. Awesome. Letter B. Going to college, also easy, right? We see that there are a total of 29 people going to college. 52 people in general, so 29 divided by 52. Excellent. All right. Straightforward, no problem. There's 52 total elements in our sample set, right, in our sample space. 22 of them fall into the category female, 29 fall into the category going to college. So calculating those two probabilities, very, very straightforward. All right. Now let's take a look at letter C. Let's find the probability of going to college given that they are female. Draw a Venn diagram below to help justify the ratio you give us a probability. All right, so first off, I just want to see if you can interpret what we're asking for correctly here. We want to find the probability that the person is going to college given that they're female, and I'll explain this kind of symbolism in a little bit, and you know, if you feel comfortable doing the Venn diagram, great. If not, that's okay. Just see if you can answer the probability question first. The probability that they're going to college given that they're female. All right, well, if you said that the answer here is 13 divided by 22, then you already have a good sense for what's going on. All right. Now, a little symbolism. Conditional probability always is going to answer a question, what is the probability of event A happening given that event B has happened, or given that we know event B has happened? So in other words, here we're saying, look, I, I went in, I grabbed a random person out of here, and I said, ah, they're female. All right? What is the probability now that they're going to college? Well, my sample space is no longer everybody, it's just the people that are within this particular circle, right? And I care, right? And in which case we're talking about these folks, right? And I care just about those going to college, right, in my numerator. So now I've got 22 people and 13 of them are going to college, so my probability is 13 20 seconds. Now how does that look sort of in our Venn diagram? Well, Remember, I've got people that are in female that are fall in the female category, people that go, fall into the going to college category, people that fall into both, and people that fall into neither. So let, let's fill this in, right? The people that are in both, right? That's that 13, right? Then we've got the people that are 
female that aren't in the going to college category, right? Those are those nine. So there's nine people that sit there. Then of course we've got those people that are going to college but aren't in the female category, right? Those are those 16 people that are male, right? And then of course we've got people that don't fall into the female category or going to the college category, right? And those are the men who are not going to college. Those are the 14 out here. But here's the key, right? When we're thinking about this particular question, right? When we're thinking about the question of what is the probability that we're going to college given, this little line means given, that we're female, we're talking about only female people or female students, then this, right? That becomes the only sample space we care about. We don't care about this, this 16 people. We don't care about those 14 people, right? Because as soon as we know that we've got a female, right, then the males that are going to college are irrelevant. The males that aren't going to a college are irrelevant. We only care about that. And that's conditional probability. In other words, you put a condition on the particular thing that happens. It's like, hey, I rolled a die. You know, what is the probability that it's an even if the number I rolled was greater than three? Well, I could have rolled four, five, or six, so there's three possibilities, and two of them are even, so two-thirds, right? That would be the probability of getting an even if I knew that I had rolled a number greater than three, versus just the probability of getting an even would have been three out of six, right? Well, then we'd have two out of three in that condition. So let's take a look at letter D. Which of the following is more likely? That a person picked at random will be going to college, given that they're male, i.e. C slash M, or that the person will be male, given that they're going to college. That's M with that vertical line, and then C. Show the calculations for both. All right, well again, let's, let's continue to kind of walk through this, right? The way that we read this is the probability of going to college given that they're a male. All right. In that case, the only people that I'm really concerning myself with are the males here, right? So my actual sample space now doesn't have 52 people. It's only got 30. And now the only people that I'm worried about going to college are the males. Why would I count the females in on that? That would be weird. They're not part of this 30. So I just have 16. All right, on the other hand, being male, given that they're going to college, in that situation, right, you know, I'm only now worried about that. I really wanted that to be in blue. I really wanted that to be in blue. There we go. Now I'm only worried about those folks because I'm saying, look, I'm already talking about people that go to college, so I'm not gonna worry about the people down in this row that aren't going to college. So the total number of people in that sample space are 29. Now I'm only going to worry about these 16 again. Now you could say, well, since they've got the same numerator, and they most certainly do, then the one with the bigger denominator is the smaller number. But if that doesn't work for you, it's kind of nice to have the decimals. Accurate to two decimal places, this is 0.53. And accurate to do two decimal places here, this is 0 0.55. So more likely to be male given going to college. Conditional probability, we're going to see some formulas that go with it. We're going to see a bunch of different things. But look, it basically boils down to this. Conditional probability takes our sample space, which could be huge, and it cuts it down, right? It basically says, look, I'm already telling you this one thing happened. So once I tell you this one thing happens, then anything that doesn't fall within that event gets kind of chucked it gets thrown away, and I don't even think about it. And again, I really like the idea of rolling that die, right? If I roll that die and I say, hey, look, I rolled a number that's, that's bigger than three, 
right? What's the probability it's even? Well, as soon as I tell you that the number I rolled was bigger than three, then your sample space is no longer one, two, three, four, five, six. It's just four, five, and six. So now if I ask what is the probability it's even, it's no longer three out of six because some of those numbers aren't even there. It is just two out of three. The four and the six are even and the five isn't. So all conditional probability is, is basically boiling it down so that you have less things in your sample space. But we're gonna develop some formulas. So let's talk about the conditional probability formulas. We can generalize the process of calculating conditional probabilities based on counts and a way to calculate these conditional probabilities based on other probabilities, which is kind of cool. So let's take a look at exercise number two. In the generic Venn diagram shown to the right, each dot represents an equally likely outcome of the sample space. Some fall only into event A, some only into event B, some in both events, and some in neither. Letter A. Consider the probability of A occurring given that B has occurred. Now again, right, that's the way we would read this, the probability of A given B, all right? So I've rolled my die and I know that the number is greater than three, right? That becomes B, all right? Now I wanna know the probability it's even, that's A, right? So I wanna give a formula for this probability based on the number of elements in each set and their intersection, right? So this is kind of cool, right? Because if I said, if I said, okay, what is the probability of A given B, then this now becomes my sample space. That's the only thing I'm worried about. So my denominator is now no longer N of S, but it's N of B. Right? Right? It's given that B has happened, then I don't care about this, this, or this. Right? I don't even care about these things out here. Now, what becomes my numerator? Well, my numerator now is going to be all the elements that are in A that fall inside of B. Right? So this is going to be my numerator, those things. Well, what gives me that? Well, what gives me that is the number of elements that are in A and B, right? It's the intersection. And again, it just makes sense. All I'm saying is, look, you know, if B has happened, then all I want you to do is think about the elements that are in B as your sample space. Now, what's the probability that A has happened? Well, I don't get to count any of these elements that are in A, but they aren't in B because those aren't part of my sample space now, my restricted sample space, let's say. I only get to count the elements that are a, in A that are also in B, and that is the intersection. So the probability of A given B is the number of elements that are in A and B. Again, that's the intersection. Let me like maybe point that down. That's the intersection, right? That's this of A and B divided by simply the number of elements in B. And again, it makes complete sense from just a very practical perspective. What we were just doing, right, when we said, well, what is the probability they're going to college if they're female, right? What is the probability they're going to college if they're female? Going to college if female, right, then all of a sudden, we limited ourselves to just the people that were in female, and that was 22. And then the numerator became this 13, right? The intersection of those two events. So make sense of the formula because it's easy enough to think about. Now, sometimes you don't have counts. Sometimes you want a formula that's just based on probabilities. Let's look at that in letter B. Divide both the numerator and denominator in A by the total number of elements in the sample space, like everything in S. Then rewrite the formula in A in terms of probabilities instead of counts. Now, side note, oftentimes when you wrote equivalent fractions, you would multiply the numerator and the denominator by the same number, right? Often you do that to get like a common denominator. But sometimes, remember, you would divide the numerator and denominator by the same number to simplify a fraction. 
and that would also give you an equivalent fraction. So all I'm talking about here is taking this formula and dividing the numerator by n of s and dividing the denominator by n of s, okay, which we can do. We can divide the numerator and the denominator by the same thing. And then what we get is the probability of the intersection divided by the probability that b happened. Now, that one's a little bit harder like to really think about. Okay, because it's easy to think about counts, all right? But here, what I'm saying is that the probability of A given B is the probability that A and B will happen together divided by the probability of B. And I'll try to make that make some sense as we work through these problems. All right. When we can count elements that lie in events and their intersection, con conditional probability is straightforward. At least I think it is. It is less so when dealing with relative frequencies or probabilities. So let's take a look at exercise number three. A survey was taken to examine the relationship between hair color and eye color. The chart below shows the proportion of people surveyed who fell into each category. If a person was picked at random, find each of the following conditional probabilities show the calculation you used. Now, Right, again, just to, to make you understand this, right? Here I've taken people and I've broken them down by blue eye, brown eye, green eye, and by black hair, blonde hair, and red hair, right? And we could say, let's say that 25% uh, of all people had black hair and brown eyes. We could say 5% of all people had green eyes and blonde hair, right? So these things are literally probabilities, but if you really want to think about them as counts, so that you could use the count method versus the probability method, think of there as being 100 people. Out of those 100 people, 15 of them had black hair and blue eyes. 45 of them had black hair. 35 of them had blonde hair. 20 of them had red hair, right? 35 of them had brown eyes. 40 of them had blue eyes. 25 of them had green eyes, right? So you can think about this from a count perspective if you say, well, let me just pretend that there were 100 people in total, it works out fine. So let's take a look at letter A. Find the probability the person picked had brown eyes given they had blonde hair, right? So the idea here is as soon as we know that their hair is blonde, right, then that is all I'm going to worry about, right? So I can think of it as being there are 35 people, right? But I'll put it in terms of I'll put it in terms of 0.35 in the denominator. But you know, you could put 35 in the denominator. Now, how many of those people have brown eyes? Well, of those people, right, because I'm only going to worry about the people that fall into that category, there were 10 of them. So I can think of it as 35, let's say out of 100 people surveyed, had blonde hair, and 10 of them had brown eyes. So. 0.10, and you could literally convert these to counts by multiplying the top and bottom by 100, and that would reduce, if you want, to 2 sevenths. Or, I suppose if you wanted to put it in terms of a decimal, and you did two decimal place accuracy, 0.29. In other words, there's about a 29% chance that if a person has blonde hair, they have brown eyes, right? As, as opposed to, right, overall, there are, there's about a 35% chance that just in general you'd have brown eyes. All right, let's take a look at letter B. Find the probability the person had red hair given they have green eyes. All right, see if you can do this one on your own. All right. Well, let me just kind of erase this really quickly. All right, so we're talking about green-eyed people. So all I care about is that row. And again, it's completely cool if you say, well, I want to think about it as being 25 people, right? There are 25 out of 100 people that had green eyes. How many of them had red hair? Well, that's going to be 15, right? So I get 0.15 divided by 0 
that's the same as 15 out of 25. And if I divide both those by 5, that would be 3 fifths. And that's 0 0.6 or 0 0.60. 60%, right, 60% of people who had green eyes had red hair. And now, the most important point, and we're going to spend all of our next lesson on this, let's take a look at letter C. Does having red hair seem to have some dependence on having green eyes? How can you justify or tell um, if, uh, tell or quantify this dependence? Sorry about that. How can you tell or quantify this dependence? Think about this for a moment. Pause the video and consider it. And the answer is yes. All right. Exclamation point. All right. Now, what does that even mean, right? What it's kind of getting at is the idea of, is it more likely or less likely that if you have green eyes, you'll have red hair than if you're just sort of coming from the population in general, right? Well, in general, in the population, there's a probability of 20% that one would have green eyes, or sorry, that one would have red hair. So the probability of having red hair is 20%. And let's put it in terms of percent. I like, I like it in terms of percent here, right? So just I just pick someone at random, what is the probability that they have red hair? 20%. Ah, but what is the probability that they have red hair given that they have green eyes? And yeah, I wrote it all the way out there because I really want to be clear about this, is 60%. There is a three times greater probability that they'll have red hair if they have green eyes than if they just are pulled from the general population. And because of that, we would say that they ha there is dependence, right? There is a three times greater probability of having red hair if a person has green eyes than, oops, than, <laughs> sorry, than having red hair from the general population. And that's not even to say the not having green eyes. The general population, right? It is way more likely that you'll have red hair if you have green eyes, according to this survey, that, you know, than if you just were pulled from the population in general. Only 20% of the people that were surveyed have red hair. But those surveyed who have green eyes, 60% of them had red hair. And that's what we're going to be talking about in our next lesson, right? We're going to really be looking at what's called independence of two events. Does one event occur really change the probability that another event occurs? Or is it basically just the same probability and it doesn't matter, right? Now, today we looked at conditional probability. And this is basically just saying, look, if something happens, right, how does then the probability change of another event? And we always use this terminology, what is the probability that A occurs given that we know that B occurs? And the key there is, whether you're trying to understand the probability based on a count or the probability based on other probabilities, the key is that we are cutting down our sample space, right, so that it only includes the possibilities that are in the given category. That then gives rise to those two formulas that we took a look at and that you'll get some practice on on the homework. For now, I just want to thank you for joining me for another Algebra 2 lesson by eMath Instruction. My name is Kirk Weiler, and until I see you again, keep thinking and keep solving problems.